Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those of you in other time zones. Uh, welcome to the release event for the Othering and Belonging Institute's brand new climate displacement database and website. I'm Bruce Hurd, and I'm the director of the Berkeley Climate Change Network. We are a network of more than 300 faculty and staff at Berkeley and up the hill at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, who are working these 300 folks on all facets of the climate crisis. Uh, so welcome. Uh, the purpose of this event is simple, to explore with a panel discussion and your questions, this newly released climate displacement and resilience database and to explain and discuss this concept that you'll hear about of the right to stay. So let's meet the uh, panel members. First, Elsa Degel Sheikh is the director of OBI's Global Justice Program. Uh, Elsa Digg's research focuses on global north, global south and equity as it relates to socio-political dynamics, nation state and citizenship and structural mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion. Secondly, we have Basima Sizemore. Uh, Basima is a senior researcher at OBI. Her research is global in scope. Uh, she contributes to solutions-based research to address structural marginality with a focus on Islamophobia, civil liberties and human rights and forced migration. And finally, we have Hossein Ayazi. Hossein is a senior policy analyst with the Global Justice Program at OBI. Across his research, teaching, and policy work, Hossein focuses on U.S. and global polit political economy, uh, race, food systems, and the climate crisis, and also social movements across the global south and the global north. Uh, Hossein uh, asked me to moderate because while we at our network are very broad in terms of covering a wide range of climate topics, we are very interested in this one. Uh, climate forced displacement, as you know, is a rapidly growing issue globally and one that's going to be center stage globally uh, very soon. So here's our agenda. Pretty simple. 20 minutes of panel discussion about the project then 20 minutes for a walk through the actual database, the case studies and all, show you how it works. And we'll have time for about 10 minutes at the end if we do our job right here uh, for Q&A. And you can put your questions in the, the chat box or the comments box and we'll we'll get to a few um, at the end. Let's start with Elsa Dig. Please give us um, an intro to your global justice program and this project. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you, co panelists um, So the Global Justice Program, uh, one of the uh, several program at the Othering and Belonging Institute that focus on cross-sectoral themes and bodies of work <clears throat> that actually try to really connect what we call it the local, the glo local phenomena to global phenomena. Uh, so the program examines and exposes the structures that contribute to marginalization of communities uh, here at home and worldwide, while at the same time it's envisioning a ways of dismantling such structures. Uh, so of course, the goal is to advance a vision of an inclusive shared destiny and a sustainable world. Our research intentionally uh, promotes structure analysis, policy interventions, and tools that can assist uh, in building marginalized groups' power to influence action on local, at the local, national, or international level. Uh, the Global Justice uh, have several projects, but our uh, work anchor in mainly in four key areas of work. One of them we will discuss today, which is the climate displacement and the right to stay. The second one is the food systems race and corporate power. Third, Islamophobia in national and global context. And lastly, the global marginality, inclusivity, and legal mechanism. And that's uh, include uh, uh, the design of an inclusiveness index that look at US states and look at nation states uh, worldwide and try to rank them uh, based on their how close they are to create an inclusive society. 
Um, so uh, also we, in, in general, you know, we, 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 we develop very significant engagement uh, with the Global South Network and partners in civil societies and social movement in global issues that align with, with, with our vision and mission uh, in order to, to promote uh, meaningful solidarity towards social change and belonging, and in order to build the infrastructure to popularize the concept of belonging worldwide. Uh, as relation to this project, uh, climate displacement and the climate crisis and the right to stay, this work emerged in the last several years. We've been contemplating with the idea why people forced to leave home. And from our research, we know that nobody wants to leave home. You know, there is voluntary migration. That's a different thing. But what we talk about it here, that when you feel when individuals, communities, and people at large feel like forced to migrate. For, for since the World War II, the focus always was about conflict and political instability. But in the last decade, and especially since probably 2015, we start to notice that there is something really other than just conflict. And those things, uh, people call them different names, but definitely today we all agree that uh, is related to the climate emergency and the climate crisis. Of course, it's still wars and political instability and economic instability contribute to that. But in, in our vision, in our understanding, we cannot separate those phenomena from each other. So we started to think about forced migration, Ferris, and we noticed what the, there is three specific mechanisms of forced people to migrate. One of them is the climate change or climate crisis, as we adopt that term. We are favoring the uh, term crisis rather than change. Uh, for several reasons, we can talk into them. Uh, we, I can get into them later on. But so our idea that we wanted it not only just to talk about the crisis in itself, but to put it in a context of historical analysis, contemporary analysis, but also to provide uh, tools, tactics for solutions, because the world over talking about this offer multiple solutions, and there is solution for, for those problems. But it seems there is something lacking, either that and the deep understanding of the relationship the climate has to other uh, uh, actions of human activities or uh, political will. So we, we thought that this became so gigantic, the number of people displaced by natural disaster and, 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 and climate induced uh, dynamics. So we thought we need to figure this out because wherever you look, you find the information, but it's extremely desperate. You know, It's very hard actually to relate them to each other. So we thought if we create a space that consists of putting the number in front of people, but also create an other association with that numbers. What does numbers mean anyway, in the terms of like, what lacking in those places, in those regions, and what the commitment we have as a global community and why we don't act in our, uh, this uh, uh, commitment, especially the financial part of it. But the big question for us was, do we know how much it costs? Because, because this is the animal, uh, this is the elephant in the room. We need to know so we can actually have a better debate, a better advocacy. And as researchers, uh, that's our role, to try to sit back, reflect, and provide, uh, without prejudice, the actual facts to people in the frontline communities, countries, and even in the negotiation within uh, the international climate talks, so they can use that for their better advance. I'll stop here because it... Uh, I can go on and on. <laughs> well, thank you, El Sadig. Uh, great intro and overview uh, of the program. Certainly some, some hot issues uh, around the climate crisis there. So uh, let's go. Second question, Hossein, um, let's jump right into it. Tell us why you're focusing now on climate displacement. Tell us more about that. And what do you mean by the right to stay? Certainly. Thanks so much, Bruce. Um, so despite the growing intensity and scale of the, of the crisis at hand, um, protections for climate-induced displaced persons forced to cross international borders are limited, piecemeal, and not legally binding. Right? So our project aims to connect demands for recognizing the rights of peoples displaced by the 
climate crisis and across international borders to the transformational changes needed to materialize what El Sadiq was speaking to, materialize people's right to stay at home and thrive within inclusive, just, and climate resilient communities. So in this light, what we conceptualize as the right to stay is not only the right for climate displaced people to safely resettle when their lives are uprooted, uh, it's also the right to stay in place amidst the climate crisis and against the extractive and exploitative structures and subsequent outcomes that are forcing them to move altogether. And so to aid the transition to climate resilient societies and regenerative economies globally, while protecting the world's most marginalized and exploited peoples and communities, we define the right to stay as comprised of a few things, right? Um, specifically the demand for legal rights for all peoples displaced by the climate crisis within and across national borders. Second, that's the demand for climate reparations to countries of the global south whose vulnerability to the climate crisis follows centuries of global north extractive and exploitative political, economic, and military activity. And third, the right to stay is the demand for just transitions toward a post-fossil fuel world that democratize, decentralize, and diversify economic activity and redistribute resources and power accordingly. Right? So um, a little bit of context in this regard, right? These demands and goals are especially important in the context of the establishment of a loss and damage fund at the 27th United Nations Climate Conference in 2022. So this is known as COP27. We have COP28 coming up um, very soon. And so the culmination of decades of pressure from climate vulnerable countries, this achievement of a loss and damage fund was a kind of collective acknowledgement of the uneven impacts of the climate crisis and the uneven financial responsibility for it. And, and that's a real promising pathway toward climate reparations in the years ahead, right? Emphasis on climate reparations, this kind of framing and what it affords. But it's also important to note that the UN's Transition Committee on Loss and Damage, this kind of decision-making body that represents a geographically diverse group of countries, actually resolved to recommend the World Bank serve as the interim trustee and host of the fund for a four-year period. And this is a kind of necessary condition taken in order to get all countries on board, right? And we've heard this before, right? What concessions need to be made in order to get all people to agree to um, whatever it may be. And this is really important to note because housing a fund at the World Bank, whose presidents are appointed by the United States, would give countries from which reparations are demanded a real outsized influence over the, over the fund itself and would result in strings attached and high fees for recipient countries. Um, and so this is all to say that despite the power of calls for climate justice and despite the power afforded by our focus on climate displacement and the right to stay, Climate justice wins are quite hard fought and face the continued risk of being eroded by dominant powers and interests, right? Which we understand, which we anticipate, and which we try to hold together here. Yeah. Thanks, Hossein. Um, uh, very helpful. Let's let's um, go a little farther and ask you and Basima to elaborate some about what you're talking about when you're talking about climate vulnerability and then how is your database that we're going to look at in a few minutes, the climate displacement and resilience database, how is that going to address um, climate vulnerability? So question for both of you. Certainly. Thanks so much for this. I'll take the, the first part of it and speak to um, this matter of climate vulnerability. Um, and then, and then we'll hand it off to Basima. Um, so by vulnerability, we mean countries and communities that experience relatively large climate loss and damage, uh, not just because the natural disasters themselves are intense, but also because of inadequate disaster response capabilities and because of economies and infrastructure that are unable to withstand and bounce back from such impacts. So critically, this follows from the ways that 
centuries of racial capitalism and colonialism have shaped the global landscape of extraction, of industry, of labor, of, of infrastructure, such that peoples that make up the global south and marginalized communities within the global north really face the brunt of climate impacts. And so I'll elaborate a bit here, right? So first in terms of industry, this kind of uneven landscape of industry. So centuries of extractive colonialism and post-colonial dependency have left countries of what is now known as the global South with a relatively large percentage of their GDP derived from agriculture, forestry, and fishing. And these are industries that are by nature more vulnerable to a changing climate. So I'll just give one example to give, to give uh, folks a sense of this is that Ethiopia's economy is largely based on agriculture, comprising 40 to 50% of GDP uh, and employing 80 to 85% of the population. Right? And although such countries have been made into um, dependent pastoral states, the pronounced impacts they experience have global repercussions. So it's not just within um, those countries that these impacts are felt. So for example, the May 2022 heat wave in India helps send the price of wheat soaring to a record high globally after India banned exports of the crop, which is devastated by dry, hot conditions. So I'm sure we all remember rising food prices, um, so memorable in, in, in 2022 and so, so acutely felt in that way. We can also understand climate vulnerability in terms of infrastructural limitations and challenges, right? So global South countries are plagued with weak infrastructures, that's dams, roads, water supplies, waste management, poorly constructed housing, and so on. All of these um, uh, render uh, climate impacts more acutely felt, right? And we could also understand infrastructure in terms of limited financial institutions, and again, few opportunities for workers and communities to diversify income streams should disaster strike. Again, Global South countries have it hard in ways that our project really tries to account for holistically. And finally, I'll just give one, one last example here of what, of what we mean by climate vulnerability in that there are really key barriers to building resilience, right? Thus compounding vulnerability. So specifically, we uh, highlight how predatory financial practices on behalf of the global north uh, that really prevent global south countries from developing climate resilience, infrastructure, and economies. So these include, for example, a high debt burden a high external debt burden, right? Meaning countries of the global south are constantly paying back colonial and post-colonial debt and doing so with high surcharges and with lots of other conditions. And it's important to note that these debts aren't ultimately paid off, right? In fact, this, is, this issue is getting worse and worse as time goes on. So in 2023, just this year, global south debt payments reached their highest level in 25 years. And so the issue has a kind of recursive element to it too, right? High debt burden means poor sovereign credit rating and a lack of access to international capital markets and lack of fiscal space for climate finance and development investments, which means greater impacts and subsequently poor credit ratings and so on, right? Um, a, a sort of quick note here is that Hurricane Maria, which hit the Caribbean island of Dominica in 2017, caused damage equivalent to 226% of its gross domestic product. And so how much can countries build resilience amidst such circumstances? And so this is what we mean by climate vulnerability, climate resilience, and barriers to building climate resilience and the need to hold these things together, which is exactly what our database and broader uh, scope of our work aims to do. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, Basima, you're gonna add here. Yes, thank you, Bruce. And thanks Hussein for opening up. Uh, there with the question, your response. I'll also add that over 70% of people displaced worldwide are from the most climate vulnerable countries, largely from within and across countries in the global south, as Hussein was just outlining for us. And so our interactive climate displacement and resilience database illustrates how and why climate induced displacement is concentrated in the global south. And, and while also providing the information needed to develop recommendations and strategies in service of the right to stay. The database seeks to address this by joining global data on climate displacement with global data on climate event exposure and vulnerability, emissions goals and compliance, governance and capacity building for climate resilience and mitigation, and climate finance needs and challenges. And also that in, in addition, and to put a finer point on how we're measuring vulnerability in our database, 
We also specifically measure a country's risk and vulnerability to climate change by way of a climate change risk um, score. And we also measure vulnerability by way of a country's socioeconomic vulnerability that accounts for factors such as inequality, aid dependency, development, factors that predispose a country to be affected by and vulnerable to hazards and disasters. And with that, we also are able to assess a country's disaster response and capacity for resilience. And to wrap up um, the question, I will add that um, a part of the database and in, in order to identify and support ongoing and future efforts to build climate resilience, we have developed dozens of case studies on the experience and activities of the climate uh, vulnerable countries. And collectively, we aim for this database to serve as a compelling research tool that will aid and inform the work of impacted communities, civil society, policy and lawmakers, who are committed to providing protections for peoples displaced by the climate crisis and the changes needed for an inclusive, just, and sustainable world. Okay, well, thank you, panel. And, and we did a good job there on time too. So um, now we're gonna turn to, to the uh, database itself. Uh, again, put your questions uh, for the panelists uh, in the comments section or chat box, and we will get to some of them uh, when we get to the uh, end here. Um, but for now, we're going to look at the at the database, and Basima is going to be our guide and going to walk us through uh, the database and the other material here. So the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So I see that we have that up. Wonderful. So this here is the microsite and our database entitled Climate Displacement, the Climate Crisis and the Right to Stay. And here, this is the landing page for our, for our microsite. And this is kind of just the hub of, oh, sorry, this is actually not the landing page. This is the landing page. And so this is a hub for our microsite um, and it kind of provides information on the project as well as the other materials, resources and items that we have that are, are part of the database in this microsite. So this is just an overview of the project itself. Here we have a link and short explainer of the database, which I'll get into more in just a second. We also have a featured case study, which is Peru. And as I just mentioned, we have developed dozens of case studies on the experience and activities of climate vulnerable countries. And what the case studies touch on, they provide an overview of the country, including climate events and climate induced displacement, the cost of the climate crisis and resilience and mitigation strategies. So that'll be um, really great and interesting to explore and we'll dive into those in a little bit. And then here we have some um, additional information on items that are on the microsite. So country profiles, which are um, profiles for countries, they include all the information in the interactive database and map, but it's laid out in a different format for people to dive more deeply into a specific country rather than navigating on a map and comparing countries that way. But all the information is the same. We have a landing page um, for case studies. And then we also have a resources um, tab, which is a repository of the Global Justice Program's research on climate displacement, as well as our research on related and interconnected thematic areas of work that are related to the overarching theme of climate displacement. And I'll just briefly scroll back up to the top here. I apologize, I'm gonna to have to move through things pretty quickly, but we certainly encourage you to explore this and take your time navigating it. We have about the project, which is a deeper dive into some more specifics related to this project and what we're aiming to do here. Please feel free to contact us. This is my email address. We'd love to hear your thoughts, feedback, questions, and opportunities for deeper engagement with you all. We also include some um, language here on the right to stay in our framework and why it's important and why we're utilizing it. And again, some more information on the Climate Displacement and Resilience Database, as well as our lead researchers for this project. All of us are here speaking today. Student research assistants that have been involved in the project over the years, as well as website developer and the image artwork that was created by the artist Leila Haidar. Um, she created the original artwork that we see on the banner here for, for this site. 
If you were to click on this, you would see the country profiles. I'll just click on that to give you an example to show you the landing page for the country profiles. And here you can um, select your country. They're all listed alphabetically. You can also come here and select the country that you'd like to, to look at if you know exactly what country you'd like to explore. Um, and I will come back to, to this in just a second. And then we also have case studies. We'll explore that a little bit later. Data sources, which are all the data sources used for the database um, and that are included in the map, we cite them here. Also our data disclaimer on the data sources and how the data is being used. Our methodology for uh, how, we, how we built out this project, as well as the criteria for how we selected the um, databases that inform um, the data sets that inform our database as well as the citation for the microsite and for the database. And then our resources tab. From here, I'm gonna to go to our database. And here you'll see, this is the landing page for the database, Climate Displacement and Resilience Database. And the database is designed to be an interactive tool to support the work of scholars, journalists, researchers, artists, policymakers, and anyone else involved in, in centering the work on climate displacement and creating strategies that support and uplift climate resilience and the right to stay. And one thing that I'll note, which was mentioned earlier, um, we um, pushed to release this project ahead of COP28, which will be held in the United Arab Emirates starting at uh, the end of this month. And it was really important that we, we strive to get this project out before that to be used um, hopefully to be used in terms of, of conversations leading up to COP28, and it can provide a resource and tools for, um, for that. So the database, as I, will, as I will show you all, visually maps the scope of climate displacement, climactic events, and risk of impact and vulnerability, countries' emissions, goals, and compliance, countries' governance and capacity building for climate resilience and mitigation, and climate finance needs and barriers. And again, I apologize, I'm gonna to have to move pretty quickly and I'm not gonna be able to go into much depth with the information that's here, but there's a lot of information and data here that um, you can play around with and explore. And so first off, I wanna show just kind of what's what shows up as default on the database in terms of information. And so here you can see we have a map. Also, if you hover over, countries' names will, will populate and appear. And we also have different colored bubbles that range in scale. And those here, we have um, a scale that is, is defined, is represents climate-induced displaced persons per country. So the smallest gray bubble ranges from one to a thousand people who have been displaced, and then the largest darker bubble is a million plus people who have been displaced. And here we have a little information icon that if you click on, it'll expand and provide an explainer for the language and the term that we're using. So climate-induced displaced persons are people internally displaced due to natural disasters. And this data is coming from the Internal Displacement and Monitoring Center, IDMC. And all of the information and data that is provided on the database will have a little information bubble that you can click on that you can get information in terms of how we're defining this, um, as well as the data source for it. So, and you can scroll or zoom in and out on the map using these icons. So if I was to click on Brazil, this is the information that pops up. Here we have climate-induced displaced persons. It's showing 3.5 million. Again, click on this icon here. We get the data source and an explainer. Climactic events. These are the climactic events that are specific to Brazil. And these are the drivers of the 3.5 million climate-induced displaced persons. So these are what have been identified as um, drivers for forced displacement in terms of climactic events. And if we click here, we'll get a breakdown of how these terms are being defined. And these are also these also come from IDMC and we have the, the source linked here as well. So if I'm to click on the profile, this takes me to specifically Brazil's profile. And again, all this information is listed um, on the map and is also listed here but it's just a little bit easier to, to view as an overview and to holistically see all the information here. So if you, if you wanna just specifically look at one country, you can come here directly and see all of this information here. 
I'm going to scroll back up to the top. And there's two ways you can get back to the database. You have this button, which is always available here in the banner. And then we also have a button here that can easily and quickly take us back. So I'm going to explore and explain um, our three indicators here. The first one, governance and capacity building for climate resilience. Um, this indicator addresses the ability of state institutions to build climate resilience and to assess a country's risk and exposure to disasters. It's particularly crucial for understanding a country's vulnerability to destabilization resulting from climactic events and also a country's capacity to cope on both the institutional and infrastructure level in terms of being able to reduce disaster risk and impact. So if we click on this, these are the different um, data sets or data and, and um, metrics that you can choose from to click on. We have climate change risk score, hazard and exposure, which has some sub items here, vulnerability, sub items here, and lack of coping capacity. And all of these, hazard and exposure, vulnerability, lack of coping capacity, climate change risk score, these measure the ability of state institutions to build climate resilience and to assess the country's risk and exposure to disasters. So I'm just gonna click on this one here, climate change risk score, and you'll see that the color changes across the map from light to dark. I'll zoom in so you can get a little better look. And here we have a key which shows um, low risk is, is one and it's the lighter color. High risk is at two and it's the darker color. And we have an explainer for what we're talking about when we say climate change risk score. And so the score ranks a country's risk and vulnerability to climate change. Um, and it's on a scale of one to 10, not zero to 10. So we'll be correcting that. But so this shows um, the, the country's risk and vulnerability to climate change. So if I click on Sudan, this is the information that pops up. And we can see that Sudan has a climate change risk score of 7.3 out of 10. We can click here, again, see that same explainer as well as the data source. And this is coming from Inform Climate Change. The next indicator I'll go to is the price tag of financing climate resilience projects. And this indicator shows financial resources needed for a country to achieve their nationally determined NDC commitments in regards to the areas of mitigation, which is mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, and adaptation, which is adapting to climate change impacts. So if I click on here, we see the total financial needs for both mitigation and adaption, financial needs for mitigation, financial needs for adaptation. I'm going to click on the one for mitigation, and this is what shows up on the map. Again, seeing the color gradation from light to dark, which indicates that a country, if the color um, is lighter, it indicates that it has less financial needs for mitigation, or it's identified less in, in terms of its nationally determined um, climate action plan. And if it's darker, then it means that it requires more funding. Um, and so here for the Central African Republic, we see that their identified financial needs for mitigation are 1.3 trillion US dollars. And we can click here, see the explainer for what that is, as well as the data source. And I'm also noticing that this needs to be changed to 2.5 trillion. So we'll be correcting that as well. For the next and final indicator that we have, it's countries NDCs goals or compliance. And this indicator addresses the status of countries' nationally determined contributions, as well as historic emissions levels per state and their greenhouse gas target. And this illustrates a country's contribution to the climate crisis and, measure, and the measures being taken to mitigate their impacts. And for those who aren't familiar with the, what nationally determined contribution means, um, it is a climate action plan that countries um, uh, establish to create emissions and adapt to climate impacts. And each country or party that has signed on to the Paris Agreement is required to establish an NDC and update it every five years. So the information that is displayed under this indicator here will um, relate to that. So if we go to total share of global greenhouse gas emissions, this is, this is what pops up. Again, we have the color gradation. The lighter shade indicates those who have contributed less to the total share of global greenhouse gas emissions. And on the darker side, it's those who those countries that have contributed more. So if we click on China, 
This is the information that pops up. And we see that uh, China's total share of global greenhouse gas emissions is at 24.23%. We also have some information on China's NDC status, as well as their greenhouse gas target, which indicates countries' goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And here we have also a number of data sources that um, are, are behind the data here. So that wraps it up for the database overview. And um, I'm gonna pass it to Hussein to talk through the case studies. Thanks so much, Basima, for that walk through. So I'll, um, I'll quickly walk us through the case studies themselves, how to access them, as well as the purpose and structure of the case studies. Um, so to access these case studies, you can either click the country on the map itself, and if it's available, click case study. So here we might click Peru and see case study there, and so that's a way to access them. Or from the top, you can click the uh, Climate Displacement and Resilience Database drop-down menu and click case studies from there. So we'll be accessing them from here. And so here you can see uh, the list and um, there are dozens of case studies currently and this is a growing and regularly updated collection of materials. So in terms of process, uh, we've, we've tried to prioritize especially climate vulnerable countries and also countries that provide key lessons for building climate resilience within nations, regionally and globally. And um, this list, uh, our, our goal for this list is that it's comprehensive and um, concise and also uh, deeply informative. So in terms of purpose then, uh, these case studies really aim to offer a finer sense of climate vulnerability, which is what I was speaking to earlier, right? So specifically, uh, specific countries and communities experience of climate disasters and colonial and post-colonial relations of exploitation, dependency, and disinvestments that have really exacerbated the impacts of such disasters and hindered resilience, right? This is part of the key context that we want to uh, offer insight into through these case studies. At the same time, these case studies really aim to offer a sense of a country's specific goals, strategies, successes, and pitfalls in their efforts to build climate resilience. So critically, this means highlighting on the one hand, uh, national plans and efforts to, for example, develop renewable energy infrastructure, uh, promote reforestation, reduce uh, emissions, diversify economies and so on. And on the other hand, the ways that the international community and Global North countries in particular must support such efforts. This includes things from withdrawing extractive industries and canceling debt to no strings attached grants and so on. Right. And so this is very much how the case studies themselves are organized. Uh, I'll briefly uh, show us this by walking us through one in particular. So, so Peru is currently the um, highlighted case study. And so I'll walk us through again each, each section and just kind of uh, offer, offer a, a couple of touchstones in, um, in each section to give us a sense of really how these case studies accomplish uh, uh, what we set out to do. So this first section here offers a brief introduction to the country. It covers the country's climate. Uh, it's geographic and social disparities within the country. It offers keynotes regarding industry, um, and it contextualizes it with regard to the country's colonial and post-colonial histories and ongoing dynamics. So, um, for example, in the chat earlier, I saw the mention of uh, conflict within e Ethiopia through which the um, pronounced climate impacts must also be seen and understood, right? And so in that case study, um, that's named as well, right? And so in this context here, um, we might hold on to what's specific to Peru and the region. Um, and, and there's one, one note that I wanna make, again, really highlighting um, countries that offer lessons for this uh, global push toward climate justice and toward just transitions. So here I'll highlight um, a keynote here that, that with regard to um, um, Peru's uh, natural resources with vast mineral and fossil fuel reserves concentrated in the mountains and mineral exports making up 60% of the country's total export revenues. Peru is ranked second in the world for copper, silver, and zinc production 
and uh, uh, top in the world, um, and top in Latin America for gold's production right here, right? And so this is, this is especially important to note, um, not only in terms of how Peru might diversify its economy and build climate resilience, but also do so in the context of global decarbonization efforts that again might um, really demand and intensify kind of extractive mining um, and, and extraction from countries like Peru that are uh, uh, resource rich in these ways. So the next section then um, covers uh, major climate events and climate induced displacement. So here we'd, uh, we'd identify climate impacts first in terms of you know, the disasters that happen and in terms of the actual human impacts that take shape, specifically displacement. Throughout these case studies, we really try to identify, again, climate induced displacement and necessary activities toward building climate resilience. So this information is quite recent too and regularly updated. So in March of 2023, Cyclone Yaku made landfall in Peru's northern coastal region, causing widespread damage and leading to a state of emergency in 400 districts, causing over $300 million in damage to infrastructure. Soon after, heavy rains and flooding displaced over 136,000 people in the same region. All right. So there's kind of uh, a pulling in of the data that really uh, constitutes the database itself, as well as a, a, a deep contextualization of it and, and um, a kind of argument that flows through each of these case studies. Similarly, in section three, we map the cost of the climate crisis, much more focusing on economic terms, right? You get a sense of it in the previous section here. We're really diving deep into it, and we've included uh, projected impacts as well. So. Uh, a part that I'd like you to pay attention to here is that every year natural disasters on average already result in 2% GDP loss and welfare loss equivalents to 5.2% of the GDP in Peru. Further, it is estimated that the climate crisis could increase the loss in GDP to 6% by 2030 and 20% by 2050. So this is key information that might not be gathered immediately from the map and database in that way, but really the case studies afford um, and, and invite us to reflect on um, on these dynamics within and across countries. Fourth uh, section, mapping resilience and mitigation pathways. Um, what's key here is what the country itself is doing in order to build climate resilience. So I'll just give one example here. Um, and, and again, this is specific to Peru, but also you sort of see trends across, across countries. And, um, and that's here in 2018, the country developed the national law on climate change regulations, establishing a framework for incorporating mitigation and adaptation measures into the planning and budgeting process at the national, regional, and local levels. Citations for all of these. So really this is an opportunity and, and, um, and means of actually doing further research um, and forms of advocacy. And so finally, we close uh, these case studies with necessary changes. So given everything we know, given everything that the country is doing, given all the limitations we've identified, um, what sorts of arguments can be made not only toward climate justice uh, for the country, um, uh, but also just transitions for the country and globally, right? And so I won't go into too much detail here, only that in this section, we really, um, we really mention that uh, countries like Peru are targets of intensified extractive mining amidst global decarbonization efforts, and that it's necessary to address such dynamics as the country and world as a whole builds climate resilience. So again, key context about, okay, what sorts of solutions are actually false solutions? What sorts of solutions um, should be upheld and what sorts of strategies are necessary in order to get us um, uh, to that sort of place? So I'll stop there as far as um, what the case studies do, how to access them, what they afford us. And, um, and now I will uh, hand it back to Bruce. Sure. Well, thank you uh, for walking us through the database and the case studies. Wow, there's a lot there. Uh, Elsa, Dig, you were going to add a few comments here on data sources. Yeah, I guess when I mentioned one in, in particular, uh, when you go to uh, uh, about the project and you look at the methodology, you can find all our and, and data sources and there is uh, also that disclaimer. But one in particular I would like uh, uh, to uplift here is because most of our displacements, uh, climate-induced displacement data come from a particular resource that uh, IDMC, uh, uh, that Basima mentioned earlier, uh, IDMC does not regard displacement uh, 
resulting from uh, weather related events are necessarily linked to climate change. And that's where we at OBI and the Global Justice, our disagreement here. And we believe that, uh, and that's how we frame this, but we wanna be in total honesty here to say, why they do not think uh, IDMC, that's, uh, that's weather related necessarily linked to climate, we say the opposite and we use that data. So we wanna make sure that to attribute that clarification because we appreciate the work of IDMC for very long time, very robust uh, data collection in the world, maybe is uh, one of the leading in the world uh, without uh, 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 dispute. But here, here the, in the beginning when I opened my, my remark, I said, why we favor climate crisis instead of climate change? That's exactly what the problem is here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, w when you hear change in any sort of context, change seems like passive, natural, uh, evolving. But crisis requires doing something wrong in order to get there. And today, without any dispute scientifically, that we know that the climate is in a really our climatic systems are in really uh, in a crisis mode. That doesn't mean tomorrow we're gonna have apocalypse, but but we're gonna be gradually. And and my colleagues talk about climate vulnerable uh, region, nations, etc. So the one who bears the brunt will be always the people who've been sacrificed. You know, sacrificed zones, sacrificed people because of colonial relation, because of. Uh, uh, neoliberal economic policy and impositions. So this is necessity for me to make this disclaimer that we at OBI frame, framing an analysis of the climate crisis contextualize weather related events and disasters and climate uh, induced displacement as a result of different social, political, economic and environmental forces that simultaneously uh, give rise to influence and compound uh, uh, the forced migration of people globally. Even we go further, we say that we address how this, if you pay attention to the case study or the three indicators that we gather together, because all this information exists, but how, when you contextualize, put them together, you will have a better sense of uh, how these forces not only exacerbated by the climate crisis, but also largely born out of this extractive and exploitative structure that have give, uh, given rise to the climate crisis itself. So it's kind of whole loop. So that, that's the reason why we say you can't just isolate weather related natural disaster and say, oh, people displaced by that, but why and how? And so in our context, that's all related to the mood of crisis that we are talking about it, that largely driven by burning fossil fuels. And does give us the context when we try to do uh, resilience, because resilience also a very co-opted terms out there. But in our research, we think this is very genuine solution. Community need to be made resilience regions and countries and, and the globe. But how you make bliss resilience in terms of a crisis? That's what necessitate uh, climate financing, which is reparation, uh, loss and damage, which every country in the world agreed on. Every country, there is no a single country opposed to it, but it takes 31 years for Global South to, uh, 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 to push harder for the people of uh, 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 governments of the world to accept that as a reality. And last year they accepted, but now the financial is a problem. So we hope to see that next week, the discussion will be around that issue. So so, so that's coupled with financing, that's what will lead us to have a genuine resilience strategies. And resilience strategies, sometimes you have to adapt to a very hostile climatic system. So if you have all what you need, you most likely you will be able to weather communities and vulnerable regions to weather uh, the, the emergency of the climate crisis. So if they have better preparedness system in terms of technology, for example, they could anticipate to move people at the time of hurricane or cyclone from the blessed till it passes. And we see some very poor country in the world doing that miraculously and some very advanced economy doing that very poorly. So 
at the end of the day is a question the, the question of resilience is in the heart of the uh, of the climate justice and just transition in itself vis-a-vis -vis the climate crisis great thank, thank you thank all uh, thank all three of you for um you know that that took us through a lot of information and, and a lot to show us in, in a brief amount of time. Let's get to some questions now. Uh, and it kind of relates to what Elsa Dig was just saying about crisis, uh, not climate change. Um, who do you want to use this database the most? You've done some great work here. And you mentioned COP28 and getting this done in time for COP28. Um, talk a little bit about who you want to get out there and get using this. I will start kicking us off and I will let the others uh, contribute to the answer. Basically, most of our work uh, as an institution that within higher learning, but is also in the large, uh, uh, as a part of a large civil society, we often see the debate and the discourse lack a fundamental understanding. So we, uh, I always say that we are privileged, we get paid to do the clarifications. Mm -hmm. So we would like our tools to translate the hard arguments, hard science, unnecessarily unseen relationships into an easy, adjustable tools for people uh, in three main, four sectors to do their job better. One, our fellow researchers. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, uh, our uh, policy advocates and policy makers. If they understand the context of something clearly, they might actually propose a good solution. Third, in larger uh, the context of uh, 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 community organization and frontline that actually fighting the fight against climate uh, mm -hmm. crisis. And lastly, but very importantly, the impacted communities themselves. So to be very well equipped and to engage in self-advocacy, they know their issues better than us. When they know all this context, their demand will be specific, precise. And if that's happening in multiple communities, we will have what the global justice aspire, a concerted effort of challenging uh, uh, the status quo in a local, national, and global level simultaneously. And that's how we see the global concept come together here. Good. Because without clear understanding among all this in different parts, if Indonesian, doesn't understand the same way as the Mexicans or the Ghanaians, if all of them are vulnerable uh, to climate crisis, therefore their ask, their uh, advocacy will be in different bowling directions, but right? it seems putting them against each other, which is shouldn't be the case. Yeah, good, thank you. Hossein, uh, Basima, you wanna add add to that a little bit about how you'd like to see this used? Are, you, are, are people planning to take this to COP28? I'll add, I'll add one quick note as to as to how it's being used and then also this database emerges as part of a constellation of, of projects works analyses and recommendations that our program has put forth so this this specific database was anticipated a few months ago um, by a research and policy brief that really um, targeted the uh, decision making process around loss and damage and how to connect climate displacement um, um, to those to those in order to really um, uh, address the questions of how might civil society policymakers and other stakeholders around the globe advocate for guaranteed protections for climate induced displaced persons within international refugee law in ways that are supported by and support the fights for climate reparations in this specific vehicle for that. So really what this what this analysis what this database comes alongside is us actually kind of diving really deep into common, doctrinal objections to calls for reparations in general, the difficulty of identifying perpetrator and victim groups and so on, right? So there's a whole um, 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 set of works, right, through which this, util uh, this, this tool comes to be of great utility for, um, for movements, for, for organizers, for policymakers, um, for governments and so on, yeah. Great, um, uh, tied to that, um, this is a, obviously a lot of work. Uh, that you all have done. What's the plan here to keep this updated? I mean, as the information changes, as you have new uh, ideas and all, um, what's the plan going forward? I can jump in and invite Sadiq and Hussein to also add. Um, 
It's a great question. And it's very, the resource, the database that we created is very much a living, breathing resource and tool. So the the goal is to have it updated as often as possible, hopefully on an annual basis. We know some of the data sources that we pulled from um, the institutions or organizations, they do provide annual updates. Others, it's every couple of years, like some it's dependent on on countries' NDC goals. So there's a lot of factors that kind of will determine how um, the database is updated and how that's reflected on our end. But the goal is that it's going to be updated um, as often as possible and as the data is being updated. And one of the goals in terms of criteria for the data sets that we had when we set out to do this project, because this is actually version two of, this is a, a multi-year project. And what you're seeing now is version two of a project that we had a lot of um, learnings from in the first iteration of this. But for this project, we saw data sets that, had, um, that were API, so application programming interface. They had that available in terms of us being able to pull from their data sources and have that populate within our own app database. And that is going to help greatly in terms of maintenance and regular updates. So most of the data sets, with the exception of one, which um, documents the uh, financial needs for adaptation and mitigation. Um, aside from that door data source, all of them are, have API uh, built into them. Um, and uh, one other thing I'll add is that this, we're going to continue to add and, and make tweaks and improve the database like as we continue at, over, over the period, over years. And, and also right after this, <laughs> we're going to be jumping in to make some, some additional changes to it. Um, but with that being said, the idea is that we will hopefully expand in terms of indicators, in terms of metrics. There's a lot of room for development and, and growth within the project. And so we're hoping to make this as robust as possible to serve sort of a larger strategy um, to advocate for, for climate refugees, climate displacement. So those are some of the immediate things in mind in terms of maintenance and moving forward. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. I noticed from your data for movement is displacement, internal displacement. Do you anticipate adding data that reflects cross-border movement? Who wants to tackle that one? I couldn't start on uh, other I could. I, I mean, our our database is not about internal external displacement. It's, it's fundamentally about displacement. So. And this is very tricky, but uh, remember that we we started our take on this uh, climate displacement about climate refugees, which nobody recognized, by the way. We we call them the climate refugees, the, the anything but refugees, because if they are refugees, uh, we, our case is rested. So we want to get to that finish line. So the international law, uh, refugee laws and humanitarian laws, only, you know, uh, uh, they have two kind of set of groups that they understand or they provide protection. The one who cross borders, international borders, and the one who are internally displaced. Both of them have protections. The only one does not have protection is the one who been displaced due to climate crisis, how we explained it earlier. So the displacement, not we are uh, concerned about the displacement uh, period, whether that internally or externally. But later we make the case that when move cross, when people move cross international border became extremely, extremely vulnerable because there is a, a zero protection mm -hmm. for them. So to answer the question, uh, uh, it's very hard to separate these two uh, because our goal at the end of the day is to look at the vulnerability of those populations that have been forced and thus give really good context for why we say the right to stay. We don't say just the displacement, but we say the right to stay. People want to stay in their homeland. So how can they stay? We don't want them to be displaced. Nobody does, right? So that's the reason why we measure the whole entire displacement process, whether internal, external, or in a move, because sometimes even the internal displaced person moves to become international displaced person. Excellent. And that's a good note to end on here. We thank uh, the panel for uh, explaining all of this in, in just an hour and, and for the great work that you've done here uh, that we're, we're all gonna use in various ways. Thank all of you out in the audience for your 
giving us your time and attention uh, today. We encourage you, this is the whole point, to use the database and the analyses and, and all the, the case studies, the great stuff that's all there. Whether you're a researcher, an organizer, an advocate, a funder, whatever you are, and please also send your comments when you've uh, had a chance to, to use the database and all the material. There are a lot of material. Uh, send your comments to OBI. We'd like to see how you're using it and what your um, ideas are for going further. Uh, again, it's belonging.berkeley.edu, climate displacement. You can probably, we can uh, throw it up on the screen here somewhere. Um, thank you. Uh, have a good rest of your day, and uh, thank you again to uh, the Institute for doing this great work. Thank you, Bruce. Good night.